Hello and welcome to Indus News Live from Islamabad. I'm Jabhat Dehami and these are the headlines. In Afghanistan, President Ashraf Ghani has signed a decree to release the final batch of Taliban prisoners as agreed by the Grand Council on Sunday. It was not immediately clear when the prisoners would be freed. The Taliban have said they are ready to start peace talks within 10 days after the release of the prisoners. UN General Assembly's President-elect Volkan Boske says the Kashmir issue should be resolved through diplomatic means and as per UN resolutions. He was addressing a joint press conference alongside Pakistan's Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi in Islamabad. In his address, Qureshi said Indian-occupied Kashmir is a nuclear flashpoint of the world and if not dealt with properly, it may have global consequences. Lebanon, the death toll from the last week's Beirut explosion has risen to 200 with dozens still missing. The country's cabinet is facing growing pressure to step down after the explosion that has ignited anti-government protests and resignations. Justice Minister Marie Claude Najam and Finance Minister Ghazi Wazni are the latest to step down. The Information and Environment Ministers have already resigned along with several lawmakers. Those are the headlines and detailed stories right after a short break. Stay tuned. Welcome back and now for the news in detail in Afghanistan. President Ashraf Ghani has signed a decree to release a final batch of 400 Taliban prisoners under the Doha peace deal. It was not immediately clear when the prisoners would be freed. Ghani signed off on the prisoner release a day after a grand assembly of elders in Kabul approved it. The release of prisoners was a major hurdle to peace talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government. Now the signing of decree has sparked hopes for peace talks to begin in Qatar soon. Taliban spokesman Sohail Shaheen welcomed the decision made by the Grand Council and said the group is ready to start the peace talks within 10 days after the release of the prisoners. Under the Doha agreement, the peace talks would lead to the withdrawal of the foreign troops from Afghanistan and end almost two decades of war. UN General Assembly's President-elect Volkan Boske said the Kashmir issue should be resolved through diplomatic means and under UN resolutions. He was speaking to the media after the meeting with Prime Minister Imran Khan in Islamabad. Khan said the UN must play its role in addressing the grave human rights situation in Indian-occupied Kashmir. More in this report. President-elect of the 75th UN General Assembly Volkan Bozkir is in Pakistan on a two-day visit. He discussed a range of issues including the Kashmir conflict, Islamophobia and climate change during his meeting with Prime Minister Imran Khan. Khan apprised Bozkir of atrocities committed by Indian troops in occupied Kashmir. At a joint press conference alongside Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi, Bozkir said the conflict must be resolved in accordance with the Simla agreement between India and Pakistan. There is also the 1972 Simla agreement between India and Pakistan, which states that the final status of Jammu and Kashmir is to be settled by peaceful means in accordance with the Charter of the <coughs> United Nations. Uh, resolving the dispute over Jammu and Kashmir is uh, key to sustainable peace in, uh, in the Southeast, South Asia. And uh, regional security uh, should be maintained through political and uh, diplomatic uh, solutions. Bozkir also hailed Pakistan's efforts to tackle the coronavirus pandemic. Pakistan has been a good example uh, for, uh, for the world with its uh, uh, policies uh, which handled uh, the, uh, the pandemic-related uh, policies very well. And it is one of the 
the figures show that Pakistan has done better than many other countries in the world, and I'm happy to observe it also uh, here with my own eyes. In his address, Qureshi said Kashmir is a nuclear flashpoint of the world, and if not dealt with properly, it may have global ramifications. Across the LOC are two nuclear powers, and Kashmir has become a flashpoint. God forbid. If, God forbid, if things go spin out of control, the world will be sucked into that situation. Before that happens, the world and the UN must act responsibly and act now. Turkish diplomat Bozkir was elected president of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly in June and is expected to officially take charge of his new role in New York on 15th of September. Reporting for Indus News, Isa Nakvi, Islamabad. Moving on to Lebanon, where the death toll from the last week's explosion at a port in Beirut has risen to 200. Beirut Governor Marwan Aboud said dozens are still missing, many of them farm workers. Over 6,000 were injured in the blast that has left 300,000 people homeless. Details in this report. Lebanon's cabinet is facing growing pressure to step down after the explosion that has triggered anti-government protests and resignations. Justice Minister Marie-Claude Najm and Finance Minister Ghazi Wazni are the latest to step down. The Information and Environment Ministers have already resigned along with several lawmakers. But the resignations have failed to quell the fury. Prime Minister Hassan Dayab has called for early parliamentary polls, saying it's the only way out of the country's crisis. Officials estimate that the blast has caused up to $15 billion in damage to the country, which is already suffering from a deep financial crisis. At an emergency international donor conference on Sunday, world leaders pledged nearly $300 million in aid for Lebanon. But they also called for economic reforms to be made. Now, China says it will impose sanctions on 11 U.S. officials, including Senators Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio. The foreign ministry announced the curbs after Washington imposed sanctions on 11 Hong Kong and Chinese officials earlier. The move by Beijing came after Hong Kong police detained media tycoon Jimmy Lai for the allegedly breaching the security law. Earlier, Washington announced its toughest ever sanctions on Chinese officials, alleging they had undermined Hong Kong's autonomy by introducing new security law. Under the sanctions, Washington froze U.S. assets of the Chinese officials. Israel says its warplanes have targeted multiple locations on the Gaza Strip. The Israeli Defense Ministry says it struck Hamas's observation posts in retaliation to explosive balloon attacks. The Hamas-linked media outlet has confirmed the claim, saying the posts were located near Bath Hanun. No casualties have been reported so far. This is the second time this week that there has been an escalation between Israel and Gaza. On Friday, Israel claimed to hit Hamas's underground infrastructure in an airstrike. Israel says it is ready to go to war with Lebanon if it feels that such a war is imposed on it. Briefing a parliamentary committee, Israel's defense minister Benny Gantz said Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrullah is Israel's biggest enemy. Gantz said Israel will continue to efforts to stop Iran from acquiring nuclear power and from operating in Syria. The threat comes at a time when Lebanon is dealing with the aftermath of the devastating Beirut explosion and a crumbling economy. India has reported the highest daily COVID-19 deaths in the world with over a thousand new fatalities and the tally crossing 44,000. In Brazil, 572 more people died overnight, bringing the toll to over 101,000 with over 3 million cases. Globally, more than 731,000 people have lost their lives to the virus with over 19.8 million infections. This report has more. The new coronavirus continues to wreak havoc in the U.S. and Latin America, where tens of thousands are getting infected every single day. In Venezuela, President Nicolas Maduro has extended the lockdown by 30 days, keeping travel restrictions to prevent a surge in imported cases. 
But Brazil and Mexico have ruled out reimposing restrictions despite a surge in infections. Now that we in Brazil have arrived at 100,000 COVID-19 deaths and nearly 3 million infections, we want to have the hope and trust that each one of us is important and also that each one of us has responsibility to act and to be aware in our country and in the world. In Washington, Democrats and Republicans have failed for the fifth time to present a new economic relief package to salvage the country's growing financial worries. Well, what we're doing is we reimburse through the general fund, not through Social Security. This will have no impact on Social Security. Uh, we're going to impact, we're going to, uh, through the general fund, reimburse. This will have zero impact on Social Security. In Europe and Australia, the second wave has dampened hopes of a revival of the economy. In Asia, mainline China continues to report cases due to local transmission from clusters. Over in the Korean peninsula, floods coupled with COVID-19 have magnified the issue as the government struggles to battle the challenge. Meanwhile, in Pakistan, the COVID-19 death rate has dropped as 15 people have died in the last 24 hours. The health ministry says 539 cases were reported overnight as the tally crossed 284,000. The ministry said over 260,000 people have recovered from the virus so far. It said there are over 17,000 active cases in the country, among which 776 remain critical. Sindh remains the worst hit province with over 123,000 infections, while Punjab has reported more than 94,000 cases. According to a ministry statement, Pakistan has decided to reopen its restaurants, cinemas, theatres and parks from today. The U.S. has slammed Yemen's Houthi rebels for the nagging on a deal to allow U.N. teams to board a rusting oil storage vessel stranded in the Red Sea. In a statement, the White House National Security Council said the rebels are quoting environmental and humanitarian disaster by obstructing and delaying. It said the Houthis have failed to follow through on their agreement to allow a U.N. team onto the Sefer. The council urged the rebels to allow access to the U.N. team for the good of Yemen and its people. The FSO Sefa has been moved seven kilometers off the coast of Yemen since 1988. It fell into Houthi hands in March 2015 when they took control of the coast around the port city of Hodada. Belarusian leader Alexander Lukashenko has won a sixth term as president. Election Commission says the sitting president bagged over 80% of the total votes. Opposition politician Svetlana Tikhonovskaya has refused to recognize official results. Talking to media, Tikhonovskaya said that she considers herself the election winner, not Lukashenko. Meanwhile, a protester was killed and dozens other wounded in mass protests erupted in the capital Minsk over alleged rigging polls. Police said they have detained 3,000 people from opposition rallies and protests. Earlier in clashes, police fired stun grenades and water cannon on the protesters. In Spain, protesters are calling for an end to the monarchy as former King Juan Carlos fled the country amid a corruption probe. The demonstrators say they won't rest until they rid the country of corruption, starting with the crown. About 100 Republicans demonstrated in Valencia, while more protests are planned for the island of Mallorca, where King Felipe VI is due to visit this week. Former King Juan Carlos abdicated in 2014 in favor of his son Felipe. Carlos abruptly announced his decision to leave the country, but there has been no official confirmation of where he went. It's time for a short break. We'll be back with more stories. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Turkey says it has killed three militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in airstrikes during a counter-terrorist operation in northern Iraq. The National Defense Ministry said military operations backed by air power were carried out in the Abbasian Basian region. The ministry said Turkey will continue to destroy weapon caches and shelters used by the terrorists. 
It said over 400 Kurdish militants have been killed in northern Iraq over the past five months. The state media said PKK militants often use northern Iraq to plan cross-border terrorist attacks in Turkey. Ankara holds the PKK responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year terror campaign. Prime Minister Imran Khan says Pakistan aims to work with Maldives to bolster bilateral as well as regional cooperation. Khan said this in a telephone conversation with Maldives President Ibrahim Mohamed Saleh. The Prime Minister shared Pakistan's perspective on peace and security situation in South Asia. The two leaders exchanged views in detail on the challenges posed by the COVID-19 pandemic. Khan also apprised the president about his global initiative on debt relief for the developing countries. He extended his invitation to President Soleil to visit Pakistan, saying he looked forward to welcoming him. Five people have been killed and 14 others are wounded in an IED blast in the Chaman area of Pakistan's southwestern of Balochistan province. Police say the bomb was planted in a motorcycle parked on the Chaman Mall Road. Assistant Commissioner of the city said the wounded have been shifted to the civil hospital. Security forces have cordoned off the area. Prime Minister Imran Khan has condemned the attack and expressed grief over the loss of precious lives. In Pakistan, the death toll in rain-related incidents has risen to 58. Three days of heavy monsoon rains have triggered flash floods across the country. Pakistan's National Disaster Management Authority said 19 people lost their lives in the northwestern Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province. It said 12 died in southern Sindh province, 8 in Punjab and Balochistan province each, while 10 in the country's northern Gilgit Baltistan region. Rain also damaged about 100 homes and caused a breach in a flooded main canal, inundating villages in Sindh province. The military said it has rescued more than 100 people from Dadu district in Sindh. In the Democratic Republic of Congo, a militia has killed 19 villagers during a raid in the eastern part of the country. The army said 10 people were killed in one village and 9 in another. It said they will eradicate those militiamen who do not want to surrender. The unrest in the region has forced over 400,000 people to flee their homes. The UN has warned that the rising ethnic violence in the country may constitute crimes against humanity. Six French nationals and two locals have been killed in an attack by unknown gunmen in a wildlife park in Niger's Kori region. The two locals killed are the French tourist guide and driver, while six were volunteers to French aid agency acted. Tilabedu region governor said the armed men arrived on motorcycles and opened fire on the aid workers. He said they are analyzing the situation. While the French foreign ministry said checks are underway into the reports of the attack. France's President Emmanuel Macron has condemned the killing as a cowardly act and vowed to fight militants in the Sahel region. Meanwhile, houses in Yemen's UNESCO-listed old city of Sana'a are collapsing under heavy rains. Months of floods and storms across the country continue to kill, displace and increase disease transmission in the Wawiri country. What in this report? The distinctive red and white mud brick houses of Sana'a's historic neighborhoods, which date back to the 11th century, have long been under threat of disrepair and violence from war. But many partially collapsed as heavy rains battered Sana'a, leaving families with nowhere to live. We call on all the organizations to save us. May God save them from hell. We call on good words to save us. Six women and six children live in this house. We don't have anywhere else to go, no friend, no relative except God. Save us with a room or a bathroom. Our house is in danger of collapsing. <laughs> Officials say citizens do not maintain buildings as in the past, leading to cracks and weaknesses. We have 107 buildings whose roofs partially collapsed and 2,005 buildings inside the city where the water is leaking through the roofs. Two abandoned buildings collapsed completely and an inhabited building that partially collapsed. Most of the reasons go back to the negligence in restoration by the residents. 
On top of the new coronavirus, which is believed to be spreading largely undetected, the rains helped spread diseases like cholera, dengue fever and malaria. Large plumes of smoke are wafting through jungle trees as the Amazon is once again under threat from forest fires. The Brazilian government data shows fires in the world's largest rainforest have surged in August. Brazilian Space Research Agency, INPE, recorded 5,860 fires in the Amazon in the first week of August. This is a 7% increase from the same period of last year. The trend suggests this month may be on par with a year ago, the worst August in nine years. Environmental advocates blame right-wing President Jair Bolsonaro for emboldening illegal loggers, miners and land speculators to destroy the forest. Bolsonaro says more mining and farming are needed in the region to lift the people out of poverty. 400 drones have performed a light show in China's central Wuhan city to pay respect to the residents. The drones took off from Wuhan's central cultural district and gave a performance at a height of almost 250 meters. Equipped with colorful LEDs, the drones displays, displayed the images of Wuhan's landmark architectures, including Yellow Crane Tower and the Yangtze River Bridge. The event was organized to pay respect to Wuhan's people who fought bravely against the COVID-19 pandemic and the flood disaster. The residents said they were deeply moved by the gesture and words displayed by the drones. They said during the outbreak, Wuhan learned that all the people share a common future. Well, so is to follow but right after a short break. Stay tuned. In Turkey, the Navy has issued an advisory for its ship or a rise to begin oil exploration in the eastern Mediterranean during the next two weeks. The step is likely to revive tensions with neighboring Greece, which also claims the oil-rich waters. Earlier, President Tayyip Erdogan said Greece has not kept its promises by signing a pact with Egypt over drilling rights in the eastern Mediterranean. Tensions escalated last month when Turkey issued a similar advisory but halted operations after mediation attempts by Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel. Greece has not commented on Turkey's announcement yet. U.S. stocks are trading higher after President Donald Trump signed several executive orders aimed at extending coronavirus relief. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is trading higher by about a percent. The S&P 500 is also trading marginally higher. The Nasdaq Composite Index is trading lower by about half a percent. Meanwhile, oil prices rose supported by an improvement in Chinese factory data and rising energy demand. England's all-time uh, leading test wicket-taker James Anderson says he has no plans to retire and that speculation over his future is unfair. The 38-year-old return match figures of 1 for 97 in the first test win over Pakistan at Old Trafford. Since making his debut in 2003, Anderson has taken 590 wickets at an average close to 27 in 154 tests. In three tests against West Indies and Pakistan this summer, he has managed only six wickets. Anderson says he is aware of his disappointing performances over the year and the competition he faces in the side. I, I want to keep playing as long as I, I possibly can. Um, I think if I keep bowling the way I did this week, then that the uh, opportunity to retire will be taken out of my hands. It will be a, a selection issue. OK, let's take you live to Lebanon, where the Prime Minister is speaking to media. and. Beirut. 
لكن نماذج الفساد منتشرة في جغرافيا البلد والسياسية والإدارية. These are the live coming from Beirut, Lebanon, where the Prime Minister is uh, addressing the media, and uh, Lebanon's cabinet um, is under growing pressure, uh, pressure from the protests uh, to resign after its, its mishandling of the uh, massive explosion in Beirut that killed 200 people. Earlier, four cabinet ministers and nine lawmakers tendered their resignation and the blast at the city's port had left over 6,000 people wounded and around 300,000 homeless. Official estimates that the blast has also caused up to $15 billion in damage to the country, which is already suffering from a deep financial crisis. And earlier at an emergency international donor conference on Sunday, world leaders pledged $300 million in aid for Lebanon, but they called for economic uh, reforms to be made. Earlier, the Prime Minister had said that uh, the situation calls for the early parliamentary polls, and that is the only way out of this particular crisis. There is a growing pressure on the Lebanon's cabinet to resign less than a week after a massive explosion in Beirut that killed nearly 200 people. Violent protests had been going on in various cities across the country over the government's handling of the crisis. The blast at the city's port had left over 6,000 people wounded and around 300,000 homeless. Official estimates said that the blast had caused up to $15 billion in damage to the country, which is already suffering from a deep financial crisis. After the blast, uh, French President Emmanuel Macron was the first international leader who uh, visited Lebanon and expressed his solidarity. And later on, uh, on Sunday, the World Donor Conference uh, also pledged $300 million in aid for Lebanon, but they called for the economic reforms. هؤلاء لم يقرأوا جيدا ثورة اللبنانيين في 17 تشرين الأول 2019 تلك الثورة كانت ضدهم لكنهم لم يفهموها جيدا استمروا في ممارساتهم وحساباتهم وظنوا أنهم يستطيعون تميع مطالب اللبنانيين بالتغيير وبدولة عادلة وقوية وقضاء مستقل وبوقف الفساد والهدر والسرقات ووضع حد للسياسات المالية التي أفرخت خزينة الدولة وأهدرت ودائع الناس وأوقعت البلد تحت أعباء دين هائل تسبب بهذا الانهيار المالي والاقتصادي والاجتماعي والمعيشي لكن المفارقة الأكبر أن هؤلاء وبعد أسابيع على تشكيل هذه الحكومة حاولوا رمي موبقاتهم عليها وتحميلها مسؤولية الانهيار والهدر والدين العام فعلا يلي استحوا ماتوا لقد بذلت هذه الحكومة جهدا كبيرا Live is just coming from Beirut, Lebanon, where the Prime Minister Hassan Daib is speaking to media, and uh, the cabinet over there in Lebanon is under mounting pressure from the protesters, and uh, the protests over the last couple of days have turned violent after the government was unable to handle the crisis uh, that uh, happened after. A Beirut explosion that resulted in the killing of 200 people and the Beirut governor also said that there are still many people missing. The blast left 6,000 people wounded and also displaced over 300,000 people and uh, the protests in various cities across the country have turned violent and they had been demanding the government and the cabinet to resign there is a mounting pressure earlier uh, the 
four cabinet ministers and nine lawmakers also tendered their resignation. And according to uh, some estimates, the blast had caused up to $15 billion in damage to the country, which is already suffering from a deep financial crisis. French President Emmanuel Macron was the first world leader to visit the country to express solidarity with the Lebanese people. And he also said that the future of Lebanon is at stake. And afterwards, an international donor conference was held on Sunday in which world leaders pledged $300 million in aid for Lebanon, but they also at the same time called for economic reforms to be made. The protesters in various cities across the country had been blaming the government of mishandling the crisis and they demanded the resignation of the cabinet ministers and the government, after which four cabinet ministers resigned and nine lawmakers also tendered their resignation. At the moment, uh, Lebanon's Prime Minister Hassan Daib is speaking to media and it is highly likely because of the mounting pressure, the government or the cabinet may resign. همنا الأول هو التعامل مع هذه التداعيات بالتوازي مع تحقيق سريع يحدد المسؤوليات ولا تسقط فيه الكارثة بمرور الزمن نحن اليوم نحتكم إلى الناس إلى مطلبهم بمحاسبة المسؤولين عن هذه الكارثة المختبئة منذ سبع سنوات إلى رغبتهم بالتغيير الحقيقي من دولة الفساد والهدر والسمسرات والسرقات إلى دولة القانون والعدالة والشفافية إلى دولة تحترم أبنائها أمام هذا الواقع نتراجع خطوة إلى الوراء للوقوف مع الناس كي نخوض معركة التغيير معهم نريد أن نفتح الباب أمام الإنقاذ الوطني الذي يشارك اللبنانيون في صناعته لذلك أعلن اليوم استقالة هذه الحكومة الله يحمي لبنان الله يحمي لبنان الله يحمي لبنان عشت ومعاش لبنان Minister Hassan Dai was speaking to media and um, it comes after the protests across the country in various cities are turning violent and the protesters are demanding the government and the cabinet to resign over their handling of the crisis after the Beirut explosion, a massive explosion in Beirut a couple of weeks, a couple of days before that sent shockwaves not only within Lebanon but across the globe and that resulted in the killing of 200 people and the, the blast at the city's port also left 6,000 people wounded and around 300,000 people homeless. The uh, Lebanese Prime Minister Hassan Dai was speaking to media live. Uh, you were watching uh, the live vision. And now the weather situation from around the world. That is all for now with the latest updates. You can follow us on social media at Indestock News.